daily landscape for me was a bedroom ceiling in a brick cottage, and I lay on my back beneath it through three long illnesses, diphtheria, meningitis, and pneumonia. Reality was the room. There was a forest in the ceiling with hills and clouds and a road to the horizon. The way into the ceiling was harder for me at some times than at others. To enter it, I had to stare at the road and remove detail from the sides of my vision by slowly unfocusing my eyes. There was one terror in the ceiling, one motionless threat. Sometimes I would look up and see no road, no forest, clouds or hills, but a plump little old woman. She sat wrapped in a shawl in a cane wheelchair and watched me like a waning moon, her head turned to the side as if she had broken her neck. When I saw her, I knew that I could die. She must not enter the room and I must not enter the ceiling. If I let her eyes blink, I should die. The little old woman came only when my life really was threatened. She was part of this plaster in the ceiling, not of my room, but of my parents. And I was taken there when I was too ill to be left alone. I think my childhood helped me in many ways to become a writer, because I had a freak childhood without knowing it. I was an only child, and I was either well and playing out, or dying in bed, paralysed, and completely isolated. I couldn't see out of the windows at all. It was during the wartime, there was cheesecloth over the windows, and I was in a white room, and so I had to tell myself stories. I projected fantasies into the patterns on the wall and the ceiling for the first half of my first ten years. Uh, I was never at school for more than a few weeks at a time. Uh, the illnesses were severe and I, I heard myself declared dead twice, which made me very angry. I sometimes feel that anger in myself when I'm writing a book. I can feel the adrenaline surge. And I'm sure if I hadn't heard the doctors say he's gone, I would have but I didn't. And therefore, I grew up as a child, never bored. I didn't know what boredom was. Totally self-reliant upon my, my inner resources for survival. And that, I discover, is the kit that a writer needs. A writer must be able to sustain physical isolation from other human beings for months and sometimes years. And worse, since physical isolation is always broken up by the milkman or the postman or shopping, worse is the isolation from the inside of other human beings, because I have to concentrate entirely upon myself. That's not quite so egocentric as it sounds, because I use myself as a lens. I experience the world on behalf of the reader through my own senses. Before I began to write, I had to find somewhere to live, somewhere where I felt that I could just settle in and be left alone. And I quartered East Cheshire to find a house. Well, not a house, a hovel, because I hadn't any money at all. And I found this place. It was 500 pounds freehold, and I had two pounds, eight and threepence. However, that problem was overcome. And the part that looks as though it's made of brick with a, a tin roof on is in fact a very ancient timber frame building dated about 1350. And that is the building I found. Because the other one, built about 1550, which looks rather posh and is, I moved from 20 miles away in 1970 when I eventually got round to putting a lavatory in. I come from a family of craftsmen, and my earliest memories of the people of my childhood were of my grandfather, who was a smith, and he lived in a timber-framed house. I don't know what he thought of me, because I was no good with my hands, and he had no other scale of judgment except his own craft. His house has been rebuilt now, and this is all that's left of it. The family totem pole. 
Everything a writer does is locked into his childhood. Down there's the rebuilt house where my grandfather lived. I spent a lot of my childhood playing there and on the hill that rises behind it, Lear's Hill. Sweep up behind you, said Grandfather. Muck's no use on road, it wants to be on field. Get your knee, your back of your shovel, said Grandfather. There's no sense in mulling yourself after death. Now come on, you shape. Joseph chopped, shoveled and threw. Grandfather worked the stone. Lear's Hill. The field is where we used to sledge when we were kids. And in the wood above, we used to play there at all hours, day and night. And at the top of the wood, King Arthur sleeps under the ground with his knights. And a wizard looks after him. He's waiting to come out and fight the last battle of the world, whenever that day's going to be. I don't know why I bother, said Grandfather. So what must I do? Let it go, let it all go for a garden? Or shall I have a word with the governor and slip him a sixpence, eh? That garden wall will never be nothing. But all your days you'll pass a dimension by long craft and you'll say, Aye, he would have basil arsed, old devil, but him and me, we built that. Behind me are the iron gates, where the knights lie sleeping, guarded by their wizard. And only this week I've discovered that in Anglo-Saxon times, this rock was called Alfwardis Hatcher, which means the gate guarded by a spirit. This hill, it, it has a meaning that's very important for me, but it's not rational. It's beautiful, but when you look, there's nothing there. But I'd be a fool if I didn't listen to it. You don't want stone, said Grandfather. No. And why don't you want stone? Because, said Joseph. Because, said Grandfather. Because of what? The words blurted out. Because of you. Oh, Grandfather was still. You're all over, said Joseph. I must get somewhere. Somewhere back of you. I must. It's me time. Else I'll never. Grandfather took off his cap and threw it on the road. By God. He stamped on his cap and turned around. By God, he stamped again. Joseph, I thought you'd never speak. Eh? said Joseph. Smithing. By God, that's a back, that is. That's a backer behind. You're not vexed. Vex me, said Grandfather. Who'll make the brick setter's trowel, Joseph? Who'll make the brickies trowel, eh? His beard danced and he held My Joseph. My grandfather had a length. grandfather, ooh, ooh, Robert. Ooh, Robert Garner was a stonemason. And this wall was the last job that he did. He built it in 1886. First of all, of rubbish, and then at this point, he took the walls of a house that was being demolished. The house was being demolished to make a garden wall, so Robert took some of it to make his own wall. But my grandfather, he was on his first day at the end of school before he became an apprentice smith. And he carried this stone down in a wheelbarrow. And behind his grandfather's back, my grandfather built in the date in small bits of stone, 1886. But uh, for me, this wall says everything. And I like to feel that my hand is continuing the flow. Stone and you, you'd never marry. I've seen it, Joseph. And Joseph, we do as best, but you're a granny raiden. Think on, and a granny raiden you'll be. So you get prenticed and a roof over you and meat in you and drink. You like to have to look to yourself sooner than most in this world. Hey, hey, he shouted to Damper Latham. My grandson, see it him. He's going for a generous, ingenious hammer man. For me, a writer is somebody who lives in their own life, their own investigation of what it's all about. They are their own scientist in their own laboratory, and that laboratory is themselves. The writer is his own laboratory, which is why 
however unpleasant he is, and in my experience a writer, is not a very nice human being as an individual. No matter how unpleasant he is, no matter how much he takes out of the rest of his family, and they're the ones who get the caning, because it never ends. Um, my wife and children are, are living with an even bigger child. That's really <laughs> what they have to live with, a big grown-up kid. Uh, the writer takes far more out of himself, but the, that, that again is not a hard matter because the compensations are so enormous. Between 1956 and 1972, I wrote five books, The Weird Stone of Brasingerman, The Moon of Gomra, Elidor, The Owl Service, and Red Shift. And at the end of Red Shift, it wasn't that I felt that I couldn't go any further. I felt that I'd reached the end of the first apprenticeship, that now at last, I knew what some of the problems were, and that equipped with this knowledge would be possible, perhaps, to do something differently. I didn't want to do something differently for the sake of doing it differently, but I felt that a whole part of me that I hadn't been able to touch was perhaps now accessible. And that was my direct relationship, not with the physical hill of Alderley Edge, but with the greater reality that that hill represents, which is the living culture of the people who live on Alderley Edge, my own family. The price that I'd had to pay in order to become what I am, that is, the cost of my education to a very high level, was that it alienated me quite automatically from the very people that I most cared for. So, from the age of about 12 to the age of about 40, it was virtually impossible for me to communicate with my family or my family to communicate with me at an emotional level. And that shows in all my books. The only thing that I could reach with understanding that we shared in common was the hill, Alderley Edge. My family understood that hill as craftsmen, and I understood it as a trained academic. And I realized very clearly through writing the next work, which was the Stone Book Quartet, that having got where I was, that is, having become the educated Englishman that I wanted to be, it was totally worthless if I could not integrate it with what I had been, and still was, but couldn't accept, which was a member of a very proud craft family. And I do know that I could not have written such simple short books of such social content and consequence until I had put in the years from 1956 to 1972 of writing fantasy, science fiction, and fairy stories, which just happened to take place on a hill. I felt it very important that everywhere that I mentioned could be touched. When I read books as a child, I was furious when I discovered that uh, the adventure I liked turned out to be a dream. Well, nothing that I dreamt was going to be a dream. It was going to be for real. So I set outlandish stories in real places so that you may say, well, I don't believe that happened, but I can show you where it happened. That's a simple level of explaining it. I usually get a spontaneous idea, which I can't identify at all, except as, that's a good idea. It can be the way that somebody is standing, it can be the view from a window, it can be something very familiar, but suddenly it has a hard line around it, and I know that that's the beginning of a book. And then at some time in the future, without warning, the second idea comes. And the only thing that they have in common with all books at all times is that these two ideas have nothing at all to do with each other. And as soon as I've thought of the second idea, the first idea, quite without 
any prompting from me comes out of my memory and the two go bang in my head and spontaneously and illogically I know that I'm going to write a book. The last four books have been specifically about this one field and now I'm moving on. Here's an example of one of those first ideas that have a hard line around them. It's the way that farmhouse stands, or rather sits, it sits down in its little valley, and I know that the first part of the book focuses for me in the gable end and the way that the gable end relates to the field going up behind it and the dark line of the hedge passing beyond that. And beyond the hedge, the hill rises up to the trees on Clockhouse Wood. And it's something in the relationship of all those patterns and shapes that give me the first foothold in the book. There is more to it. The thing that brings that building into very hard focus for me is the tragedy in that in 1926, the farmer who lived there accidentally lost his temper with his daughter and accidentally killed her with a knife. And he just didn't want to uh, live after that, and he was hanged at Walton. Now, I'm not going to write a book about that incident, but there is, if you like, an enormous belt of psychic energy in that building for me, which gives the gable end the hard focus. And uh, there's something about the melodramatic quality, which must have been terrible, the way that the girl ran from the farm past uh, all the places that she'd known, down the farm track, across the road, to the farm where uh, I think it was her cousin was having his tea, and she died very dramatically. And, that, and that's the stuff of Wuthering Heights. But um, I've got to find a 1980s version of that, which has the same emotional intensity and tells a quite different story. And I think that's, that is a part of my job. I find the places where the energy is available and I lift it out. I have to understand what it is. In this case, I have to understand about the accidental murder. But then I have to pass the energy through me like a transformer. And by using its setting in this square mile or so of Alderley Edge in the next field from where the last four books were, I've got to hold on to that energy until it's lost all its historical shape, all the, all the tragedy, and then release it as pure energy in a new form, which will be the book. Well, from the ideas, I can begin to understand what it is I have to find out. I have to do a lot of reading. And for me, that's the most interesting part of the whole job of writing a book. I have to put together ideas in such a way that nobody has seen them, them fit before. And this can go on for a very long time. I read and read and read and read and make notes and refer to other books. And then very gradually it dawns on me that there are no more books to be read. I can't put off the day any longer. I've got to write my own book. The trouble is that I have no idea what that book is. I don't know what the story is. The worst part of writing a book for me is when I have read all the other books because there's nothing else to do except write my story and I have no story. It's what I call the oh my god phase. The shortest the oh my god phase has been before a story develops after finishing doing all the reading has been a year and the longest is four years. I now know with experience that it's the hardest work of all. Again, without warning, a sentence presents itself in my head, and I don't know what it means. It's a complete sentence, a statement, and I write it down because just like the early ideas, that sentence has a hard line around it. And that sentence is always, or has always been so far, the last sentence or paragraph of the finished story, but I don't know what that story is. Now, I'm really, at this point, ready to go but I still can't quite do it. I have a period of growing excitement when I feel that something's about to happen and then rather like the moment when you're half asleep and your foot slips off the curb, I lurch inside myself and I hear somebody speak. I don't actually hear them, but I have the impression that I can imagine voices and I can half see people. 
So I stop and say, do that again. And it's rather like spooling back a tape recording and winding back a film. I do it again. And this time I can see a bit more clearly. I can't see who they are or what they are, and I can't hear what they're talking about. And gradually, I go back and back over this process of re-spooling, rewinding, replaying, until I get the sound and the film in my head in sync. And I don't ask any more questions, and I don't think about what I'm doing. I suspend judgment of everything. I just concentrate on getting the words down. And I now know that I'm on my way, and there's something like 40 to 60,000 words to get down. Well, the writing of the book is just straightforward slog. It's manual labor, and it's physically very exhausting, and it, it can go on for anything up to a year. There's one moment which is always the same, and that's the moment of finishing the book. Well, it's not a moment, it's more or less 48 hours. I start to write faster and faster and faster. I don't sleep, I don't eat, I can't control the thing. It's accelerating. And suddenly, there is that last sentence. And every time, I have an enormous panic and think, suppose I don't hit that sentence. But every time, of course, click. It just happens. The end of the story fits into that last sentence. And the book is finished. I use mythology and folklore when I use it, not to deflect the attention away from reality, but to focus the attention of the reader on the reality behind apparent reality, the reality behind the three-dimensional world, because it was that reality that was real for me in childhood. When I lay in bed, if I looked out of the window, I sometimes saw the real world. But if I moved my head, all the buildings wobbled. But if I closed my eyes, I could see things and keep them in focus. And so I don't make any excuses whatsoever for drawing on fantastic materials to, to make comments seriously about modern life. And I may be able to write about the kitchen sink if I ever find anything at all interesting near the plug hole. I don't think there is such a thing as the perfect book, and certainly there isn't for me. I suspect that for myself I build in something that I'm not going to spot until later, which makes me go cold when I read it, but it's a genuine deliberate mistake, so that I'll have the energy to go on and try and do better next time. <clears throat> there is always that feeling of, well, next time I'll get it right, next time, and each time I find something else that I'll do better next time, and so it will go on. I think there is not so much a perfect book, but a piece of work, the, the sum total of a life's work, which when it's put together at the end, people can stand back and look at it and say, well, that is exactly what we'd expect from that man. And yes, he got it right. That's not perfect, it's not perfection, but it is for me. And that's, I think, all that I want. There is absolutely no way of telling that what you see on television is any more fantastic than life itself. The whole thing is really an illusion, or it is real. It's, it's all in the eye of the beholder. And as far as making this film's concerned, um, well, of course we've cooked the books. It would have taken too long to film a life. But what we have done is tried to present, in a way, a novel, a fictional uh, a fictional recreation of reality in that what I have said and what we've shown, we have chosen to do. The creative moment was in the choosing. What we did was real. And therefore, this is a real film. How's that?